Lots of people these days are pretty concerned about living their best life. Have you heard that phrase tossed around? Living your best life. Yeah. There, I mean, there's, there's a few different ways to think about what it means to live your best life. I think that phrase, at least as it's used generally speaking, or perhaps at its worst, can be an attempt to justify living whatever way we think will make us happy. Uh, at its worst, it's a way to justify basically doing whatever we want, because that's what will be my best life. It means not letting anybody else tell me how to live my life. It's about owning and controlling my own destiny. It's not all bad, but you can see the dangers of living such a self-interested life. At its best, I think living your best life is an attempt to live a meaningful, purposeful, and fulfilling life. There certainly is nothing wrong with striving after a life that has meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. But the problem is, living your best life is your best life. It's whatever you decide is meaningful. Whatever you decide is purposeful and fulfilling. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I have come so that they might have life and have it abundant. And so Jesus actually came to give us our best life. The problem is our best life, as found in Jesus Christ, is radically different from the best life that the world is constantly chasing after. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we're diving into what I think could be called the best life. Instead of calling it the best life, we're going to call it the blessed life. Last week we did a quick overview of the Sermon on the Mount. And we spoke about how familiar some of the portions of this passage are. Particularly the golden rule and the little passage that says, do not judge. And so, although this is a familiar passage, uh, we want to strive to correctly understand it in its context. And so, uh, we spoke at length about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew puts it here in his gospel. We discussed the spiritual reality of that kingdom for us today, while also recognizing that it has its coming fulfillment in the future. And therefore, recognizing kind of this already but not yet nature of the kingdom of God. And we put forth kind of the title of this whole series as being the Sermon on the Mount, Kingdom Living in a Broken World. So we have this, these spiritual realities that will find their fulfillment in the future, and yet we're living the reality of those blessings today in the midst of a broken world. So kingdom living in a broken world, we're going to see hopefully how King Jesus radically transforms us from the inside out, rather than from the outside in. Right? So this is not the Sermon on the Mount where Christ simply gives us a new Ten Commandments, as it were, for us to follow. No, in fact, he actually changes us and transforms us so that what has true of us inside will show itself on the outside. So, as we think about the Sermon on the Mount, the speaker of the Sermon on the Mount, the person who was preaching the Sermon on the Mount is, of course, Jesus. Yes, it's okay. You can participate a little bit. If I think you're participating too much, I'll make you be quiet again. Jesus is the one who is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. King Jesus. He's Christ. He's the promised Messiah. Last week, we went back through the first couple chapters of the book of Matthew and saw that he is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He was the one who was born of a virgin, worshipped by the wise men, and dreaded by King Herod. 
because he knew what the Messiah meant, that he would no longer be king. This King Jesus was proclaimed by John the Baptist in chapter 3, and now in, in chapter 4, leading up to chapter 5, Jesus himself is pronouncing the kingdom of heaven in verse 17 and preaching the gospel of the kingdom in verse 23. And so his ministry is now in full swing. He is preaching about him as the king and his coming kingdom. And these people, he, he's, he's developed a, a great following. Okay, all of these people are following him. They're wanting to know more. Who is this guy? Some who believe, some who didn't, some who are curious. And people wanted to hear from him. And so the king is ready to give his speech. And you, you can just almost imagine, I like, I like to put myself in the shoes of the people who maybe were following him and, and just ready, what does this king have to promise us? Like what kind of, how great is this kingdom going to be? And you can just imagine their surprise as he starts off, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted. Well, that's not what I was expecting. That, that would be my response as I anticipate these messages from the King, the promised Messiah, the greatest sermon, the greatest preacher. I just wish we had the entirety of this sermon documented for us. Uh, but we only have what was probably the outline of it. And so Jesus is the preacher. Who was his audience? Who is he speaking to on the Sermon of the Mount? Well, in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So minimally, we have his disciples. Now, we have to recognize this term disciple is a pretty broad term. And so this could be referring to the 12 disciples. It could be referring to much more, maybe 20 disciples or 200 disciples or maybe even 2,000 disciples, people who were following him. If you look towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 28, it says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. And so at the very least, we know there were crowds who heard the Sermon on the Mount. So his closest disciples, yes, they were likely there. But he also addresses those who are following at a distance. He addresses the most religious of the Jews in pretty strict ways, as we'll see in the weeks to come. I think he also addresses in the Sermon on the Mount those who are following at an even more distance, just curious, who is this King Jesus? No matter where an individual listening to this found them, themselves falling on that spectrum of maybe 12 disciples all the way to people who are just curious who this guy is, this sermon would have been pretty surprising and not what they expected. What's the message? The message of the Sermon on the Mount in many ways is giving expectations of this kingdom that is at hand, as Jesus said. It encourages kingdom living in a broken world, as we've already highlighted. It explains to us how King Jesus transforms us from the inside out, and it starts with the Beatitudes. This idea of what does it look like to have a blessed life? What does kingdom life really look like? We know what he was about to say to these disciples was of utmost importance. In verse 1 it says he sat down. In that day and age, whenever a rabbi or a teacher was sitting, that's when people knew it was time for him to really bring the lesson. Rabbis, of course, would disciple their followers as they were walking, as they were going, as they were doing life. But when they sat down, that's when the teaching was happening, the more formal teaching. It says also in verse number two, he opened his mouth and taught them. 
It's like, okay, Matthew, as opposed to keeping his mouth closed, <laughs> like, what, what's that all about? Well, if you actually read through the Bible and, and look at other instances where it says people open their mouths, usually that's used when they're about to proclaim something very, very important. We see this in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, and then also in chapter 10, verse 34, when Philip was about to expound the scriptures to the Ethiopian eunuch, it says he opened his mouth and expounded the scriptures. And then Peter, before telling everybody in Acts chapter 10, this new reality of the gospel available to the Gentiles and not just the Jews, it says he opened his mouth in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. And so anytime that phrase is used, it's probably an indicator that something pretty important is coming after. So he sat down, he's ready to teach, he opens his mouth, and he taught them. These three things combined together seem somewhat repetitive, but repetition, repetition seems to emphasize that which is important. That's true all throughout the scripture. You can think of even the passages that say verily, verily, truly, truly, repetition. Pay attention to what's about to happen. And so this teaching is essential for Christian living. Uh, some would say the Sermon on the Mount is essential for Christian living and the Beatitudes are the essence of the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, the Beatitudes really start us off with a bang and start revealing just how radically different this kingdom life really is for the follower of Christ. The values and pursuits of the citizens of heaven are drastically different from what the world is constantly chasing. The Beatitudes, the characteristics of the kingdom, how to live the blessed life. So, as we start reading through these, and as I read this morning, you see that every single verse starts with blessed, blessed, blessed. What does that mean, to be blessed? What does that word really mean? You guys have heard my spiel about how the world kind of encaptures this term of blessed, basically anything that they like that happens to them. Oh, so blessed. Absolutely. And that's not wrong in and of itself, but this term blessed means much more than that. It goes much deeper than that. It does literally mean happy, but the Greek word goes a little bit deeper to kind of underline this idea of those who are fortunate to receive God's grace. Everybody who receives God's grace is fortunate because you don't deserve it, right? That's why it's called grace. And so this idea of receiving the grace of God, being fortunate to have that, gives you a sense of deep inner joy, an unshakable delight. Oh, the happiness or the bliss. Blessed are those who have that sure foundation, as it were. This idea that no matter what else is happening in the world around me, I still am blessed at the root of my being, not because of what's happening around me, but because of what God has done in and through me. I remember the first uh, paid vacation I was able, ever able to take uh, when I was working for Wells Fargo, kind of my, my first real long-term job where I got PTO, Okay, I went down to Arizona with my family and uh, we went golfing. And like, I'm not that good of a golfer anyways, but I was playing awful. And if you ever golf and you play awful, you tend to get a little bit angry. Uh, it can happen from time to time. Uh, yes, that even as a pastor, I get angry on the golf course because things are not going my way. Uh, I'm not happy. I would not in that moment say that I was blessed. And I don't remember where it was along in, in that course of 18 holes, but my, I remember my dad turning to me and saying, just remember, Tyler, you are literally getting paid to golf right now. <laughs> and you know, that kind of changed my attitude a little bit. In the grand scheme of things, life was pretty good. 
And that, that gives us just the tip of the iceberg of what is true for us as followers of Jesus Christ, as citizens of heaven. That no matter what our current circumstances might cause us and tempt us to respond in, in different emotional ways, we are still blessed. It shows you kind of the, the deepness and the, the just solidness of what that term really is trying to accomplish for us. And so it might include happiness, of course, but it's not reduced to only happiness. Notice again that uh, these, these verses are not commands or imperatives, right? Rather, they're almost congratulatory exclamations. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the, the meek. Happy, blessed, joyful, complete are the people who these things are true of. They're not requirements to enter into the kingdom, but rather characteristics of the people who are in the kingdom. They're descriptions and commendations of the good life, the best life, or as we're calling it in the, the several weeks to come, the blessed life that's available through Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look throughout the next couple weeks at these different beatitudes, as it were. And today we're actually only going to look at the first one. I will likely do more than one at a time in the weeks to come, just so that we're not in Matthew for the next three years straight. But today we're just going to tackle the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, first of all, let's talk about real quickly a couple of things it does not mean. When I first read poor in spirit or just hear that term, somebody is poor in spirit, what my mind, I don't know what your mind automatically goes to, but my mind tends to think of somebody whose spirits are down, right? Think of somebody who, man, their, their spirits are really down. They're, they're lacking vitality. They're lacking happiness, as it were. That's not a complete understanding of what it means to be poor in spirit. It's not simply downheartedness or depression. It wouldn't make sense to say, happy are those who are not happy. It's something more than that. It also does not mean happy are the financially poor. Although the financially poor oftentimes are happier than those who have lots of money. That's not first and foremost what it's speaking of. And actually, as we'll see in just a moment here, we can learn a lot about what it means to be poor in spirit by looking at those who are financially poor. But it does not primarily mean financially. It also is not a lack of spiritual awareness so to speak. So to be poor in spirit is, is not just to simply mean, well, that person just has a lack of understanding of their spiritual state. In fact, I would argue it actually is the opposite. It's a, it's a very acute awareness of the spiritual state that you find yourself apart from and also with the work of Jesus Christ in your life. And so that, that's some of, the, some of the things that it's not specifically referring to. What does it mean? Well, we'll start with that word poor. The word poor literally means destitute. It means to be a beggar. There's, there's a couple different words in the New Testament that refer to poor people. There's, there's one that refers to somebody who has very little, but they're working hard to, to make things work. There's another word for somebody who literally has nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're absolutely destitute, completely dependent on other people for their literal livelihood. And that is the word that's used here for poor. Absolutely destitute. Proverbs 16, 19 says, It's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoils with the proud. And so here, it's not that you have a little bit to work with, 
but it's that you absolutely have nothing. So we're poor in that sense, but then the clarification comes in the fact that we're poor in spirit. Meaning, this is a type of spiritual poverty. It's a recognition that you in and of yourself are spiritually bankrupt in and of your own accord. On your own ability, you're unable to make any contributions. In order to gain spirituality, you're destitute and completely dependent upon the help of another. That's what it's getting at when it's talking about being poor in spirit. John Piper gives a list of, of the way that he summarizes being poor in spirit. He says, it's a sense of powerlessness in ourselves, a sense of spiritual bankruptcy and helplessness before God, a sense of moral uncleanness before God, a sense of personal unworthiness before God, a sense that there is to be, if there is to be any life or joy or usefulness, it will have to be all of God and all of his grace. And then he says, I say it's a sense of these things because the reality is that these things are true of everybody. But those who are poor in spirit are the ones who are aware of these things. And so being poor in spirit means those who are aware of their desperate spiritual need. They are self-aware. How woke of us. <laughs> but really, even that self-awareness never comes because of anything that we've done or because we're so spiritually privileged. It's because of God's grace. It's because he, through his spirit and likely through his word, has actually opened our eyes to the truth of our desperate need of our almighty creator. And so let's look to just a few other scripture passages real quick that might help us to understand this a little bit more. The first one is Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who, inhabited, who inhabit, inhabits eternity, sorry, uh, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high place and the holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That's very similar to this idea of being poor in spirit. Isaiah 66, verse two, all these things my hands have made and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Psalm 51, 16 and 17, you will not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it says David. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. If we flip to the New Testament in Philippians chapter 3, I think Paul understands this idea of being poor in spirit in chapter 3 of Philippians and verse 3, where he says, we worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Jesus Christ, and we put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in myself. He goes on to say, if anybody should have confidence, if anybody should be able to boast about what he's able to do in the flesh, it should be me. And he goes and, and basically lists his resume of all the super spiritual things that qualify him to have confidence in his flesh. And yet he says, no, I count all of those things as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He wants to be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Being poor in spirit means having absolutely zero confidence in yourself. You understand your spiritual bankruptcy. Turn with, turn with me then to, to a final section here, Luke chapter 18. I think this gives us a good little illustration or comparison of somebody who is poor in spirit as opposed to somebody who is not poor in spirit. Luke chapter 18, 
verses 9 through 14. That's not Luke. That's why that wasn't making sense. Here we go. Luke chapter 18, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Follow along with me as I read, starting in verse 9. It says, He also told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But this tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift, lift his eyes to heaven. Instead, he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Those two guys, both coming to the temple to pray, demonstrated vastly different postures of their heart. The one, I would say, was poor in spirit. He understood his, his spiritual bankruptcy, as it were, his desperate need for Christ and his grace and mercy. He couldn't even bring himself to lift his eyes toward heaven. Meanwhile, the, the Pharisee comes up with his chest all puffed out. Look at me, God. Look at all these wonderful things I have done. Shower your blessings upon me. I mean, it couldn't be any more different. To be poor in spirit. To understand that apart from Christ, even our greatest attempts at righteousness are as filthy rags. I'd like to give you just a few comparisons and clarifications so if that's what it means to be poor in spirit, what would the opposite of being poor in spirit look like? I think the opposite of being poor in spirit would be to be proud in spirit or to be self-sufficient. That's what we saw from the Pharisee. He doesn't really need God. After all, look at how great I am. Look at all these wonderful things I have done. I don't need you, but I think I deserve your blessings because of all that I have done. I think many might say, how could God save a sinner like me? I've done too many bad things. But unfortunately, I think even more people find, them themselves, find themselves saying, why do I even need God in the first place? I'm mostly good, I'm capable, I'm strong, I'm determined. I will pave my own way. I will put destiny in my own hands. Thank you very much. I don't think I'll be needing that savior of yours. They don't understand their utter need for a savior. They don't understand their spiritual bankruptcy. They don't understand that they actually need to be clothed in the righteousness that only comes from Christ in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. We cannot produce that type of righteous clothing for ourselves. And so it might be, it might be easy for us to maybe criticize those who don't yet know Christ and who think, oh man, I'm good enough. It's easy for us to look at them and point the finger, but what about us in our practical daily living? Do we maintain, of course, we, we, we in some ways had to come to a point of being poor in spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's, in fact, we'll get there in a second, but that's why it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because these people are the ones who understand their need. They, they're at the point where they can put their trust and faith and believe in the only one who can get them what they're looking for. But what about in our daily living? Once we have entered into the kingdom, once we are children of God, do we trust in God's 
righteousness just for our salvation or do we continue in that posture of our heart? Continue waking up every day recognizing that on my own I am poor in spirit. I'm spiritually bankrupt apart from what Christ can do in me. The opposite of poor in spirit is self-sufficiency. I want to talk then quickly about the differences and similarities between being poor in spirit and being humble. Okay, these two ideas are very closely tied together. But I think they're also very distinct. And so I, I would say that I believe being poor in spirit is what leads to humility rather than the other way around. If there's ever humility apart from being poor in spirit, there's a good likelihood that that humility is some type of false humility that's being put on for show, which is ironic because that's actually a prideful action, right? Look how humble I am, okay? You can't say that. It doesn't work like that. It's only when you're poor in spirit, truly poor in spirit, understanding your absolute inability to produce righteousness on your own, your desperate need for Christ, it's only on reflection of that that you can actually exude any type of true, genuine humility. And so being poor in spirit leads us to that type of humility. I think that's an important distinction because that also keeps us from just kind of wallowing in our humility, as it were. See, the, the, the beautiful thing about being poor in spirit and understanding our brokenness and our inability and our basically worthlessness apart from Christ is that he doesn't leave us there, right? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He became sin who knew no sin so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. And so we don't have to stay wallowing and, and thinking to myself, oh, look at me, I'm so worthless. That's a, that's a false sense of humility. Constantly just downplaying your own worth and value because you're so worthless is, is, is in fact looking for attention. And it's, it's not fully understanding what Christ has done for you. Yes, you are worthless, but you have Jesus. And so being poor in spirit and humility are similar but different ideas. D.A. Carson said it this way, it's not a man's confession that he is ontologically insignificant or personally without value, for such would be untrue. It is rather a confession that he is sinful and rebellious and utterly without moral virtues adequate to commend him to God. But praise be to God for his glorious grace. And that's what we'll see time and time again throughout the Sermon on the Mount is how dependent we are upon God to transform us from the inside out. It's only by his grace working in and through us that we would ever be poor in spirit in the first place. And so it's to the poor in spirit he gives the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting as we walk through these different uh, statements, it's this first statement in, in verse three and also the statement in verse 10 that are current promises. So blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is, is the kingdom of heaven. It's theirs to have right now, of course, future fulfillment, but the, the promise and the spiritual blessings are ours to have. Look at Ephesians 1, 3. In Christ, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Similarly, in verse Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All of the other results here, verses 4 through 9, they will be comforted. They shall inherit. They shall be satisfied. They shall receive. They shall see God. And so those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy 
those who are poor in spirit who will turn most quickly and most fully to the sufficient grace of God in their lives. The reality of being a child of God, a citizen of heaven. This eternal life which begins now and will find its fulfillment in the future. So a few things to consider as we go from here this morning. A few takeaways. Number one. There's just a hope that God and his word would open our eyes ever so consistently to our desperate need for our Lord and Savior. I hope and pray that everybody here this morning has come to a point in time in their life where they recognize that they are indeed a sinner. That indeed the, the wages of our sin, the results, the penalty of our sin is death eternal separation from the creator God of the universe in a very real place called hell. We all need to come to a place where we recognize not only the truth of that, but also the truth that I cannot dig myself out of that hole. I cannot ever do enough good things in order to merit my eternal life. It is all based on the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross on our behalf. And so I hope and pray that everybody here this morning could say that they have come to that point where they have become poor in spirit, understood their spiritual bankruptcy, and trusted in Christ to fulfill that need. Secondly, I hope that those of us who have come to that point in our life would continue to have that heart posture on a daily basis that we might wake up each and every day saying, Lord, I need you. I need your word. I need your spirit. I need your help. I need you to live in and through me today so that you might receive glory. This morning, let's thank God for the grace that he gives us to see with spiritual clarity Let's pray that poor in spirit would be something that characterizes our lives. And may we believe with everything in us that developing that quality by the grace of God more and more in our lives really is an aspect of having a blessed life, the best life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. God, even though we have only scratched the surface this morning of these beatitudes, of these principles of living as citizens of heaven in the midst of a broken world, we already see that when you do that work in us, it radically changes our pursuits, it radically changes our desires, it radically changes the way that we view the world as a whole. First Corinthians says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is come. And so Lord, we pray that you would just continue to grow within us this heart posture of being poor in spirit. Absolute destitution absolute dependence upon you each and every moment of our lives. Lord, we thank you that by your spirit, through your word, and by your grace, you have developed this and will continue to develop this even more for those of us who are children of God. Help us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.